So the first thing you might be wondering is why do we call this a world war? Quick glance at this map will tell you exactly why. The only countries not involved are the ones that are shaded in gray. The green countries would be the allied powers. The orange countries would be the central powers. Now it might look like the allies had a huge advantage here, but remember, a lot of what you see in green would be colonies of the various allied powers, especially Great Britain. So for example, where you see almost all of Africa in green, we saw relatively few African troops involved in the war. However, we call it a world war because it touched every continent in the world except for, of course, Antarctica. World War I was a blend of old and new. At the start of the war, we saw some of the old leftover trappings of war, uh, when it was still glamorous, when it was still an adventure. So, for example, uniforms. The Belgians wore bright blue uniforms with a red sash across the front. In the old days, these would have provided a beautiful picture of men marching to battle. In the new days, they provided a beautiful target for machine gunners. Bayonets, uh, the long knives that were attached to uh, the end of rifles would have been used in hand-to-hand -hand combat in old wars. In this particular war, the bayonet was really more used for killing rats uh, than anything else. Troops on cavalry, or troops on horseback, excuse me. It's hard to believe that less than 100 years ago we were still fighting battles on horseback, but in the early days of World War I we saw exactly that. That clashes with the new technology we saw. Uh, railroads to deploy men and supplies to the front. Machine guns. A machine gun could get off about 600 shots in a minute. The, a good soldier could get off about five. Machine guns, as you see here, were operated by a four-man team. One man would aim and fire the gun. One man would keep the ammunition rolling into the gun. And the other men there were in charge of keeping it cool. Uh, machine guns would jam about every two to three minutes. You'd have to then dump water into special parts of the gun to cool it off. If you ran out of water, uh, urine was a common substitute. The machine gun changes the way we fight wars because we can't line up in nice, neat, straight lines anymore. If we do, we become a nice, neat, straight target. So the machine gun really is going to be sort of the emblem of World War I. The machine gun forces us to get into trenches. And this is a diagram from overhead of a trench system. If you look from the back, or excuse me, from the top of the screen, that would be the back of the trench. That's where we keep our supplies, our ammunition. That's also usually where the generals would hang out, where they were nice and safe. In front of that, we had our heavy artillery to bombard the other trench. And then you'll notice we had a whole series of trenches going up to, towards the front line. So we get past the support trench, which would be there in case the trench got broken into and then the front line trench, which is where you would be facing the enemy. In front of the front line trench, you see there is barbed wire, and then an area called no man's land. No man's land was the area between the trenches belonging to neither army or to no man. In some places, these trenches got huge and elaborate as battles went on for seven, eight, nine months, even well over a year. Another cross-section of a trench right here, uh, you'll notice we had a place that was ideally tall enough for a man to walk standing up, some were not. Okay, we had the trench board, which is also known as the fire step, which you would step up on to fire your gun. Uh, then we had sandbags and other sorts of defenses, once again, ideally trying to make it so that you would not be faced with, um, you would not be faced with the constant threat of death. That being said, it was a miserable existence. The trenches were obviously open holes outside. When it rained, they flooded, as you see here. Now that water is not clean. It's full of dirt, it's rainwater to begin with, and in the trenches there wasn't always time to go find a latrine. So a lot of times you would go to the bathroom where you stood. So you'd be standing in that water until it drained out or evaporated. Here's another look at life inside of a trench right here. You can see these guys are living uh, amongst the mud and the dirt, and you would be covered in mud and dirt the entire time you were out there. Uh, hygiene was at a minimum, which of course also led to outbreaks of disease and things like that. Once again, life in the trench, we see a guy sleeping in his trench here, and that would not be uncommon. So think for just a second here. You're in your trench, you're catching a quick nap, suddenly a poison gas shell explodes. That's going to be a fairly horrific experience for people. 
Right here we see repair work on the trench. The other feature of trench life was constant work. Again, we have simply uh, tunnels of dirt. They fall down, they collapse. So you'd constantly be repairing the trench when you weren't worrying about the enemy crossing over. Uh, this is a front line attack trench. You guys can see the men hunkered down here. The reason they would be hunkered down would be artillery shells, but more importantly, snipers. If you got curious and peeked your head over, you risk being shot to death for no apparent reason. You guys can see the attack stations as well uh, towards the top right of the screen. Men going over the top, and this was the worst part of trench warfare, when the generals decided we have to go take the other side's trenches. As soon as you left the trench, you were exposed to machine gun fire, mortar fire, artillery fire, so on down the line. Going over the top for, for a platoon would have meant that in a lot of cases, less than half would come back. This is a sentry, so he's actually between the trenches. His job was to crawl through this tunnel into this little post and make sure the other side was not attacking. So he would be fully exposed the whole time he was out there. And uh, a lot of times, in a bizarre twist, the enemy sentry would be 15, 20 yards away. So we saw a lot of scenarios where the two side sentries would simply sit there and talk to each other throughout their shift uh, on days when not much happened, which was actually a lot of days of World War I. This is barbed wire strung out in front of a trench. This was particularly horrible because as you were running forward, you wouldn't notice it. You would get caught. The more you struggled, the deeper you were caught, and then you were just stuck there for machine guns. There were some battles where the two sides afterwards would call a truce so they could cut the remaining parts of bodies out of the barbed wire in front of their trenches. This is the results of a months-long battle. This used to be farmland and forest. Now it looks like something off of another planet. And that would be the results of essentially daily shelling from mortars, uh, from artillery pieces. A little bit later on, bombing from airplanes, so on down the line. So where these battles took place, these areas would be useless for a very long time to come. Some of the other new things in World War I, airplanes. Uh, airplanes originally were used for spying because they could fly over the enemy trench fairly safely and they could tell you where the enemy was. A little bit later on, they'd be used for bombing. Uh, the first bombs were actually dropped by hand uh, out of the plane. We'll move on to more sophisticated bombing by the end of the war. This is also the era of what we call the dogfight, where skilled pilots with uh, machine guns mounted on the front of their planes uh, would go after each other. The most famous of these, of course, would be the German pilot, the Red Baron, and his very famous opponent, of course, Snoopy. This is a late World War I bomb, probably about a 500-pound bomb. And they call it a 500-pound bomb because it have 500 pounds of explosive in it. This would be a great way uh, to knock out enemy artillery or collapse part of an enemy trench. One of the most frightening weapons of World War I was poison gas. And poison gas was delivered in shells like you see here. What you do is put the gas into a, a glass canister inside the shell. You would then fire the shell through a mortar, like you see here, and then when the shell would land, the gas would be released. Uh, there's two types of poison gas, and both of which were really terrible things. The first was called chlorine gas. For those of you wondering, yes, it's the same stuff that goes in your pool, but in tiny, tiny, tiny little concentrations in your pool. What chlorine gas does is it, it dissolves the alveoli inside of your lungs, the little sacs you see here at the bottom of the screen that allow oxygen to pass through. If you inhaled enough chlorine gas, you essentially would suffocate. Now, not all attacks were fatal. The most common uh, ailment from a poison gas attack, other than death, would be blindness because it would cut off the oxygen to the point where uh, your optic nerves would fail. That blindness could be temporary, could be permanent. Uh, Hitler was actually blinded in a gas attack during World War I. The other kind of gas was mustard gas. Now, not the yellow stuff you put on your hot dogs. It got its name because it was brownish yellow like mustard. Mustard gas was a blistering agent and caused what you see down here on the bottom of the screen. If you inhaled it, it would cause those blisters inside of your throat and lungs. And again, if you inhaled enough, it would cause suffocation. Both were very, very horrifying weapons and brought about the development of the gas mask very quickly. The first gas masks were simply rags soaked in ammonia. You hold them over your nose and mouth and that would protect you. 
Before long, we have the models that you guys see here in the picture, which is pretty much the standard for a gas mask today. Now, fighting the war. Germany had wanted to win the war quickly. In fact, they thought they'd win it in 42 days. Their plan was known as the Schlieffen Plan. Germany had a problem because they had enemies on two sides of them. So they thought what they'd do is overwhelm France and then go attack uh, Russia. Now, if you take a look at the red arrows here on this map, what the Germans were going to do was send wave upon wave of soldiers into France, surround the French army, and force them to surrender. Once they were done with that, they'd take the whole army back across Germany and fight the Russians, who they thought would take a very, very long time uh, to get prepared for war. The Schlieffen Plan breaks down at the First Battle of the Marne, which takes place just about 30 miles outside of Paris. As the battle went on, word got back to Paris that the, the Germans were about to break through. So something truly extraordinary happened. The bus drivers and taxi drivers in Paris started picking up soldiers and driving them to the battlefield. And the men would run out of the, the, the streetcars and the buses and run into the battle. They got there just in time to stop the Germans, at which point both sides dug trenches and the Schlieffen plan officially failed. The war in the East was a little bit different. There was a lot more room and a lot fewer men. So the Russians really drove the Germans crazy for the first three years of the war. Germany had to keep diverting troops back to the East, in part because Austria-Hungary was a really terrible ally, and the Ottoman Empire did very, very little. So with the Eastern War going on, the Germans cannot focus on the Western War uh, in France, which is the war that we more think of. This will set the stage to where eventually the United States can come in and turn the tide of the war. The Eastern War ends with the Russian Revolution. The Russians had been harboring a guy named Vladimir Lenin, who had a, a philosophy called communism. They drop him into Moscow in 1917, and as the people of Russia are starving to death, the revolution uh, builds momentum and eventually overthrows the government of the Tsar. Uh, once Lenin's government takes place, one of the first things they do is get out of the war. 